Welcome to the County Manager's Report. I'm Lloyd Higuera. With me is Douglas County Manager Steve Mokroheiski. And welcome, Steve. Thanks, Lloyd. How are you? I'm well. And how are you doing? Doing great. I'm glad to hear that. We, uh, we got our first snowfall of the year. Oh, wow. It's and good to see some snow in the mountains. It is. And, uh, and, you know, we thought maybe it would never snow again after <laughs> last winter, but it's... Uh, it looks like we're getting off to a good start. Yeah, hopefully it stays there. We get more throughout the year, and we have a nice uh, heavy snowpack this yes, year. Yes, sir. Well, we have the uh, Douglas County Commission meeting to look at. The last meeting was up at Lake Tahoe. Was that the 18th? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't write it down for some reason, but I'm pretty Let's sure. Let's go with it. Let's go with the 18th. Let's go with the 18th. Go with the 18th. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. If both of us think it is, it sure. probably is. And um, commissioners did hear an update at that meeting on the uh, center median at Highway 395 and Service Drive in Gardnerville. Yeah. That median, of course, is now referred to as the Walmart median. Right. And uh, what's the latest on that? Well, we, you know, as we talked about at the meeting and, and uh, I think has been reported uh, in the newspaper, we've requested from the Nevada Department of Transportation uh, that they allow, when we actually submitted, we hired um, R.O. Anderson, a local engineering firm, to develop uh, um, some conceptual designs for how we would uh, do a temporary cut of the median to allow access onto Service Drive until Walmart opens, which we believe could be anywhere from two to three months from now. So it would provide about two to three months of reprieve for those local businesses uh, until Walmart opens up and Grant Avenue, Carrick Lane, and, and all the uh, supporting transportation elements are completed. Um, so we're waiting for a response from NDOT. We did have a, a conference call last week with uh, a number of folks on our staff, uh, Rob Anderson um, and two of our commissioners, along with the NDOT director, the new NDOT director and his staff, to make the pitch for why we think this is appropriate and we can do it in a safe way um, and the responsibility that the county is taking on. What we've said is we've essentially asked Walmart to step aside and allow Douglas County to take the lead on this. We had, we had initially asked Walmart to um, redesign the median and submit that uh, redesign to uh, to end out for approval it was taking time for walmart to work through their corporate chain and get approval for redesigning all this and we finally just said we need to move quickly and in order to do that walmart will you step aside so we asked walmart to step aside douglas county has taken the lead um, on that redesign and the submittal with end out so we, again we've submitted that to end out we're waiting for a response um, we're, we're hopeful, um, but we also understand that, you know, NDOT had expressed to us concerns about providing that temporary access that it would sort of change the uh, or confuse the driving public about not having access now and then having access again and then not having access at some point in the future. Uh, nonetheless, that's been our request uh, for the, from them. If they allow that cut in the median, then we will, um, uh, we will, do, we will pursue that. If they do not allow it, then we're not in a position that we can do it. It's a, it's a state highway. Um, the median is essentially, it was constructed by Walmart, designed by Walmart, constructed by Walmart, and it's on a state highway. So what we're trying to do from the county perspective is take a leadership role at this point in, in the project and, and assist in rectifying this, this uh, really unfortunate uh, situation that we have. Um, there right now, but we can't do it unilaterally. We can't just go out there and rip the thing out and do what we want on a state highway. We need the permission from Nevada Department of Transportation. So we're hopeful that within the coming days we will uh, have a response from them and then we'll proceed accordingly. If they don't grant it, if, if NDOT says, no, we're not going to allow you to make that temporary cut, then we'll be in the position of working with NDOT to open up Grant Avenue which is the new road that will access Walmart and will also access uh, what's called what will be called Carrick Lane, which is um, will connect to Service Drive. So that will be sort of the primary access point for people to get to those businesses on Service Drive. So Plan B is if we can't get temporary access onto Service Drive directly, we're going to work with uh, with NDOT and Walmart to get Grant Avenue opened as soon as possible prior to when Walmart opens so that at least we can get that traffic flowing through there. Well, Grant is paved now. So, right. I mean, it, it could open fairly quickly. It, it could. Grant and then Carrick Lane is the other one that has to be completed. There were okay. some changes um, that needed to be made to allow for truck traffic to uh, access the turning radius from Grant Avenue onto Carrick Lane. 
to be made safely by trucks because you know the the um, the trucks that access Ahern and CarQuest and those other businesses have to be able to make the turn from Grand Avenue onto Carrick Lane. Those issues are being constructed now, um, and so that once that's completed and everything is is signed off and approved by NDOT, then we're hopeful we can open Grant Avenue and Carrick up, and then that provides access there. Typically, those roads are not opened until Walmart or whatever store it is opens. And what we're saying is, look, if you're not going to give access, direct access via temporary cut onto Service Drive, you at least have to open up Grant Avenue um, to allow you know access that way. Otherwise, you've got really Southgate is the only way that that uh, people can get to those businesses. So again, we continue, our role as a county is at this point to be an advocate for our local businesses to try and get uh, whatever reasonable signage so people know where they're going and how to access these local businesses. And there, there is ease of access, as easy, you know, as easy as we can make the access for the public to get to these businesses, we wanna try and do that. Okay. So Grant to Carrick uh, would get you to Service Drive, right? And then uh, below that or uh, north of that is what was the name of that? Southgate. Picture? Southgate. Southgate. Southgate is, is the northern entrance, right? You can access Southgate right from 395 north or south, right? And then you hit the median, and and once Grant Avenues open up, you drivers will be able to the public will be able to go left onto Grant from 395 southbound left onto Grant Avenue, they go down Grant to Carrick to service. So okay. that's, that's they can access it both ways. What about a U-turn at Grant? Grant okay. U-turns would also be uh, allowed there. They will okay. not be prohibited. And we also have secured approval from NDOT to allow for appropriate signage at Grant Avenue, permanent signage that, that ultimately directs traffic to those businesses that'll say, you know, business access, um, for, service to, for service drive, use Grant to Carrick, basically. Right. So we're trying to make the experience as easy as possible. We understand the challenges right now. Grant isn't open. Carrick isn't open. So service drive, or, or I'm sorry, Southgate Drive is your only opportunity there. But ultimately, when all these improvements are constructed, we want to make it as easy as possible for the public to access, to know where they're going, and then to access it. And then it becomes a matter of people, you know, the behavior yeah, the, the traveling behavior of the public um, um, being experienced on a regular basis, and you get used to doing that in a certain way. Well, nothing happens fast with NDOT, you know, I'm <laughs> and so uh, it could be a good long while uh, before any, any. I mean, they may turn down uh, the temporary cut, uh, and then, but it would be a good long while before Grant and Carrick and all these other things are in place. And so, I mean, uh, I mean, it could could be a, a while before this really gets settled. It it, it could, uh, you know. And again, I think the frustrating thing for everybody, the businesses, and the people who are trying to access it, the county, um, our elected officials, the public in general, is is that um, you know we don't know when exactly those things are going to be open. We need NDOT to approve it, and we need Walmart to. Uh, you know, Walmart has a say in some of these matters too. So that you, you know, we're not in a position to make unilateral decisions. We, we, it requires these different entities um, to participate in that. We've worked actively. NDOT has been responsive on some of these things with the signage and and the consideration of opening Grant Avenue sooner than is typical in these situations. So I will say that they've been responsive on those things. We hope that they'll be responsive to our request that, you know, we turned around, we had uh, R.O. Anderson and our staff had this redesign and the whole timeline and every, the commitments mapped out within a matter of a couple of days and submitted to NDOT. You know, uh, within a matter of a couple of days it was done. And we've, we, you know, now we're about um, four days, in, you know, business days into waiting for response and, and we'll continue to do that. Um, but we're moving as quickly as we can. We hope that NDOT is responsive to that request on a temporary basis, and if not, then we'll continue to pursue every uh, viable option to get uh, the best uh, access for the public and for those businesses. So I guess suffice it to say, we'll be hearing more about this one. We'll keep we'll keep talking about it. You know, uh, unfortunately, um, I, I I wish and and many other people wish that this wasn't an issue that we were having to deal with. Um, but and and look, I'll clarify this for the record. People asked why. Was the median put in, bef you know, at this time? Why did it need to get put in? It, you know, Walmart they designed it. 
Um, and it, and it went through the approval process and the county was aware of that portion of it, it was ultimately approved by NDOT, but the timing of the construction was up to Walmart. I mean, that, that was in, in, no one was really aware of when that timing was gonna occur uh, for the construction of the median. So, you know, they, they put that in there based on the sequencing of all the improvement projects they needed to make. And um, it was unfortunate, I think, to say the least, the timing uh, the, you know that, that that happened and now we're dealing with the, um, the challenges of trying to rectify that situation at least on a temporary basis. So we'll keep plugging away at it, keep reporting and, and telling people where we're at. Okay. Also at that meeting, uh, commissioners approved a contract in the amount of $487,000. This is for the construction of a uh, DART, that's Douglas Area Rural Transit, uh, one, a communications project they're working right. on. Can right. detail on that? Yeah, this is um, $487,000. This is federal money, mm -hmm. a federal grant um, that came through the state of Nevada and was awarded to Douglas County to connect the Douglas County Transportation Maintenance Yard, which is out off of Airport Road. If you go down uh, Airport Road, before you get to on the, uh, on the north side of Airport Road, before you get, get to the airport directly, um, where all the school buses and the fueling station and we call it the county yard. Right. Um, that's where the DART, the Douglas Area Rural Transit buses are, are housed and, and where that operation is sort of based out of. And then the management of that operation takes place out of our senior center currently. So this project is to connect with uh, microwave, Ethernet microwave connection, the tr maintenance yard uh, out off of Airport Road and the senior center. Um, uh, with high-speed bandwidth for voice and data communication. So we spent a lot of time on, on figuring out how to best engineer this project and get it, um, get it done. One of the things that we're really pleased with, in addition to the fact that we're using federal dollars for an important communication project, we've been able to award the contract to a local company, oh, Curtis great. & Sons uh, Construction of Minden. So we're, we're really happy, you know, it had to be publicly and competitively bid. And under state law, we're not allowed to arbitrarily give a contract to a local Douglas County firm over another. Um, but in this case, we were able to uh, award it to a local contractor. So uh, almost half a million dollars in federal money that's going to go towards uh, supporting local jobs in Douglas County and an important communication project. So we're really pleased with that. Just a quick side note, uh, the entrance to the airport is uh, looking pretty good. Yeah, have you been out there? Yes, I have. Isn't that nice? Yeah. You know, we talked... Um, and uh, thanks for making that comment, Lloyd. We, um, I've worked with our, our airport manager, Bobby Thompson, and, and as we've made all these improvements to the airport operational improvements, getting the ordinance changed, um, the expansion of the soaring operations, the concern was what's gonna happen to soaring? Well, soaring is- Is soaring. Is soaring. <laughs> I mean, it's going gangbusters and they're doing wonderful things and so, We've, we've, as part of all those efforts, really wanted to improve the aesthetic experience and the sense of place when you drive up to the airport that you experience a really unique, you know, small general aviation airport that supports um, soaring and sport aviation and the rural aspects of our community. But, but nonetheless, you experience it when you go in. And, sure. you know, the airport has been always something that you sort of drive down Airport Road and, and then all of a sudden there. You're, <laughs> you're there in a parking lot and you go, I, I guess I'm at the airport now. That's but right. you never really feel like you've entered the air. So we are doing some things and I'd encourage uh, people to take a drive out there, stop by our airport administration office, talk to the friendly folks um, at the Minden Tahoe Airport. Uh, but experience the new signage, the landscaping, An entrance. the entrance, the greenscape, the trees, right. uh, the bushes, everything that we've done to really say, now you're here. <laughs> and this is something that our community and visitors can really be proud of. So we're excited. It's a small thing. We hired a local firm, uh, Genoa Trees, uh -huh. to do all that landscaping. And uh, it didn't cost us a lot of money. We had it within the airport budget to spend that money in the airport budget is generated from businesses at the airport. So it's right. not tax dollars. So we're able to take that revenue generated from airport businesses and tenants and put it back into the aesthetic value of that area. And uh, we're really pleased with it. Well, it looks great. Thank you. Uh, commissioners heard quite a few presentations at their meeting. Um, they heard a presentation on a tourism destination economic impact analysis study for the South Lake Tahoe uh, 
or the South Shore area of Lake Tahoe. Uh, can you give us detail on that? Yeah, and this is our effort to, you know, um, over the course of the past year and a half, we've worked with various stakeholders in the South Shore, City of South Lake Tahoe, Douglas County, the business community, TR, uh, Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, uh, and, and other stakeholders to say, look, we, we, we may disagree on a number of things, but I think we can all agree that the state of the South Shore in terms of the infrastructure and, and um, the buildings and, uh, and the challenges we have from an economic standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, and from a community standpoint are broken. And the status quo simply is not an option. So as part of that effort, you know, develop this South Shore vision, collaborative process between the two states and all those stakeholders. And we worked with a, a local consultant to look at the economic side of this so that we can start to quantify and tell the story about, well, what are the challenges economically that we have? So that's what this study was done um, and the report was provided to our board. It's also been provided to the city of South Lake Tahoe. Um, and on uh, Octo October 23rd, we had a, uh, a workshop, a public workshop for people to come and hear this presentation and talk about the state of the South Shore economy. And, and so much of this deals with the recognition that I don't think is a secret to most people. The gaming industry in the South Shore has been on a decline for the course of the past decade, far beyond the recent economic downturn that we've had. And it really deals with competition from the California side with um, uh, Indian gaming and and other opportunities there that that have uh, declined in the gaming share of dollars, and so we said we we really need to look at it reshaping this model. It's no long, longer going to be a gaming centric economic model in the South Shore. It needs to be that will be a component and an important component that will continue to draw people, and it's an element. But we need to expand on the recreational amenities that now people are coming to the South Shore because they actually want to get out of their cars, get out of the casino and experience the environment, the man-made environment and the natural environment, have access to the lake, have trails, biking, hiking, uh, shopping, food uh, experiences. So it's this economic study was quantifying those challenges we have with the way that the, the economy is set up at the South Shore currently and the changes we need to make and we all need to recognize need to be made in order for us to improve the economy, improve the environment, and improve the community. So we're pleased that this is this, you know, one of the early steps in again telling that story and, and getting our arms around what the problem is so that we can implement the reasonable solutions and uh, really improve our community at the South Shore. I see. Well, there's lots of gaming around nowadays with Indian casinos and that, but nobody has Lake Tahoe, you know, that, that environment. Yeah, it, except it, for Lake Tahoe, it, 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 it's an icon, and yeah. um, and what what has always struck me about the South Shore is the natural environment is second to none in the country, right? And maybe in the world, um, but the human built infrastructure has not been touched for fifty years, and it's out of date. It is creating more environmental degradation. Um, than rebuilding the built environment would do. We actually would have environmental gain if we redeveloped the existing infrastructure that's there. Yet we have challenges with some environmental groups um, that believe, you know, particularly in the California uh, uh, areas, that believe that the status quo will save the environment. I mean, I think most reasonable people understand the status quo is not is actually hurting the environment. And so we're coming to that recognition that you can have it both ways. You can both improve the economy by rebuilding the built environment and thereby improve lake clarity and the natural environment. And so I think when we all come to that conclusion, um, we're going to be in much better place to implement these solutions. Okay. Another presentation uh, commissioners heard was transitioning to local planning. This is all part of the uh, TRPA's regional plan update. Right. Right, and we've talked about this here with the regional plan update, the bi-state consultation work group between Nevada and California, um, Secretary Laird and Director Drozdoff and California and Nevada respectively, and the natural resources agencies that brought folks together to work out the differences between the environmental community, the business community, and the local government community and move this regional plan forward. One of the big pieces was 
the shift of lo to, to local planning and permitting to allow local jurisdictions to take on more of the planning and permitting roles from TRPA. Allow TRPA to focus on the uh, big environmental issues of regional significance, allow local jurisdictions to focus on local planning and permitting. And so that's what this discussion was. And, and we continue to feel like we're making positive progress. Great credit to the TRPA staff, Joanne Marquetta and John Hester and Arlo and, and all of their staff who uh, just continue to work really well with the local agencies and the business community move that forward. And we can look for this update sometime in December, right? Yeah, the plan is at this point that the TRPA Governing Board would take up approval of the regional plan in December. Okay. Another presentation commissioners heard, this was from the Nevada Tahoe Conservation District on a budgetary estimate to meet the total maximum daily load stormwater load reduction goals. Yeah, it's interesting how all of these kind of feed into it. We talked yes. about the state of the economy and how, you, you know, in order to achieve... Um, environmental gain in the natural environment. You have to rebuild the existing built environment. The regional plan update with TRPA and the shift to local planning to allow TRPA to focus on issues of environmental, re regional environmental significance. And here, one of the big issues of the total maximum daily load, we call our friend Mahmoud Azad, the late Mahmoud Azad, who called it a total load. But it's scientific evidence that you know, attempted to quantify fine particulates that found, have found their way into Lake Tahoe that have created a degradation in Lake Clarity. So one of the big issues for environmental groups, uh, business community, local governments um, alike. And so this 2004 baseline uh, load study identified uh, 125,000 pounds of, of sediment into from the Douglas County area. And so our requirement is 10% or 10% reduction uh, of that, or 12,500 pounds of reduced set, uh, fine uh, particulate sediment into the lake um, by, two th I believe it's by 2015. Uh, we believe that our, to date, Douglas County has achieved, our conservative estimate is around 10,000 pounds. So we're very close, we believe, to achieving that, uh, I'm sorry, that 10% reduction goal, uh, five-year reduction goal initially. We've done that through a number of things, improve, uh, implementation of capital improvement projects, water quality improvements um, that have been made at the lake, private parcel best management practice uh, implementation that's taken place in residential and business areas and private land. And then the third piece, which we're still working on implementing, is the advanced road operations, trying to capture those fine sediment particulates from uh, from county roads, from GID roads, HOA roads, and from NDOT roads, capturing them before they find their way through the stormwater system and into the lake. So continue to work on the TMDL issue, but in Douglas County, we're really pleased that we it believe almost there. We, we're, we're getting close to that five-year reduction plan. Right. Okay, very good. Uh, commissioners introduced an ordinance at the meeting to expand the powers of the Tahoe-Douglas district. This is to provide water, storm and drainage services within their service area. And this one's been going on for a while, and I guess it has more of a course to go through. Right, this is about the third time we've heard it. We first came to the board and asked them for direction. They said, let's do it. And then we're going through the, um, the ordinance process to allow the Tahoe Douglas District to provide this service with really the primary goal that they have the ability to submit a proposal that we have out on the street um, to allow for, for somebody else to take over operation and maintenance of our lake water systems. We believe that either KGID or Tahoe Douglas District or Round Hill um, GID may be able to provide those services at the same or better quality service at a lower cost. Okay, it sounds good. Uh, Commissioner has introduced another ordinance. This one amends county code in regard to disciplinary action for exempt employees. And this is way over my head. It, you know, it might be over my head too, Lloyd. Yeah, but this is is essentially to make our um, our code compliant with federal law. In 2005, the uh, Federal Department of Labor um, allowed more flexibility for employers to discipline um, exempt uh, FLSA, Federal Labor uh, Standards Act, exempt workers through salary deductions. Previously, exempt employees um, could be disciplined by withholding salary and, and uh, suspending them for more than a week, but not less than that period of time. So this 
makes it our code consistent with federal law and allows employers to discipline exempt employees by suspending them um, for one or more full work days. So it's kind of an internal... Sort of a, an thing. internal cleanup item, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, commissioners uh, have a meeting coming up on November 1st. And uh, do you have a preview yet of? Uh, of I do, and, and I would and say also there's a change of location right, too. Right, there is because of early voting. Early voting, early voting is sure going on vote. now, and we want to encourage people to get out and vote. And um, they have an opportunity to vote uh, at various locations over the course of the next couple weeks prior to November sixth. If you, regardless of where you live in Douglas County, you can vote at the old historic courthouse. Um, so you can call the county manager's office or any other. A county office and they can direct you to the appropriate locations and timing of doing that for early voting um, but due to early voting we're moving our board meeting typically at the historic courthouse to the emergency operations center the east fork administration building on county road so uh, it will be thursday november 1st at 1 p.m at uh, the east fork administration emergency operations center on county road right next to the library right next to the library exactly most people know what a library is yep yep and um so we have a couple items there we have a, a presentation by the bureau of land management on the public scoping process for the carson valley discovery trail on the west side of the pine nut mountains um, in carson and douglas counties we have a presentation on the business science park viability study by the nevada venture accelerator we're excited about that effort the business science study that really talks about um, uh, opportunities that we have to capture some unique uh, techno technological and manufacturing businesses in the Carson Valley, unique to anywhere else in the world. We'll talk more about that at the next, uh, um, the next taping here. And a number of um, uh, additional uh, second readings for development applications and master plan amendments that were heard at the prior uh, Valley meeting, so we'll have those from community development. Um, and then the approval of the, this is the second reading and approval of the Tahoe Douglas District um, ordinance. So uh, again, you know, a number of items that have previously been heard by the board and, uh, and a couple of presentations there. Okay, well, we're running out of time, but I think it, it's uh, noteworthy to mention that uh, there was a groundbreaking that took place last Friday, and uh, that was the 19th or right yeah let's call it the 19th we <laughs> said the board meeting was the 18th <laughs> yes. so let's call friday the 19th friday the 19th and uh it was for the uh, community senior right. center and uh that went very well it was very well done and yeah. uh we've got about a minute okay scott, scott morgan <laughs> and his staff and community services just uh you know i'll give credit where credit is due right um scott morgan and his staff just did an outstanding job in my opinion and I think anyone who, we had about 250 people who At showed least. up for the groundbreaking, um, just, just wonderfully organized and orchestrated. And uh, um, we had seniors, we had families, we had youth. The, the foundation that was formed to generate uh, private dollars to pay for the furnishings and equipment and other amenities inside the facility um, uh, were all there. They raised, I believe, around eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 just at, at the groundbreaking. We officially broke ground and uh, we're really excited about it. You'll start to see uh, site work happen in mid-November. Uh, we'll then go out at the, uh, in December and hopefully award the contract for the uh, transportation improvements on Waterloo Lane early 2013. And then we're uh, looking forward to construction beginning the uh, uh, spring, summer of 2013. Well, it's great to see it actually happening. Yeah, That's super we're, we're really excited. Well, Steve, I want to thank you for being here thank on the you, County Lloyd. Manager's Report. County Manager Steve Mokro-Heisky, I'm Lloyd Higuera, and we'll see you next time on the County Manager's Report.